was a geek as a kid. I still am. And I was fascinated by technology and science. I wanted to understand things. I thought tanks and airplanes were the coolest thing on the planet. And I wanted to become an astronaut or maybe win a Nobel Prize in physics. One of those, one of those two. And so I went to Caltech. That's geek mecca to you guys, OK? So, and uh, I wanted to meet other people like me that wanted to figure things out, right, and solve problems, OK? That's, and, and there's a whole bunch of people like that at a school like Caltech. And so, but when you meet these Nobel Prize winning professors, you feel kind of like pond scum. Will I ever come up with a good idea? And so I spent all my time at Caltech trying to come up with a good idea. And my breakthrough came in a modern optics class. So the professor is, is busy telling us about this cool technology called pattern recognition. And you have a, a missile, because this is the 1970s, and all the jobs for engineers were working for the military contractors, right? And so this is this missile, and it has a, a camera in the nose. And then inside the mind of the, of the missile is a representation of a tank, you know, the target. And so it zooms around, and it blows it up. Wow, that's such cool technology. <laughs> and I went back to my dorm room, and then I started thinking a little differently. I said, I wonder if there's a more socially beneficial application of this technology. I got to scratch my head. Oh. Instead of recognizing you know, a tank in the battlefield, maybe you could recognize letters and words, and you could read to a blind person. That would be so cool. And that was like my one good idea in college. And I had no idea how I'd actually do it, you know, how I'd put that within the reach of a blind person. But, but I thought, that's my one good idea. And I, I kept that, that idea in my heart. And so I went on, came up here to the Bay Area, started a PhD program at Stanford, and promptly dro dropped out to join a startup rocket company. And, you know, I mean, astronaut, missiles, rocket on the launch stand. Ooh, it was so cool. And our, our business manager, who's from Texas but went to Stanford, but she's doing, she's doing the countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, shit. <laughs> the rocket blew up on the launch pad. Ah, end of my rocket science career. But I still had aspirations, so I came back to Silicon Valley. And you have to celebrate failure in Silicon Valley. So I and my former boss, we got together, and we started our own rocket company. We tried to raise $300 million, and no one gave it to us. <laughs> Couldn't quite figure out why. And, uh, but, the, but then my boss, Dave, uh, said, oh, I know this guy, Eric. He's a chip designer. He has an idea for a company. Let's go talk to Eric. So we went over, and we went and we talked to Eric. And Eric said, I want to make a chip that could do one thing really cool. We'll build a company around it. I said, what is it? You can make a chip that like, looks at a piece of paper and recognizes the letters and words on it. And I'm like, that's, that's my one good idea from college. You can make a reading machine for the blind with that. It was, it was like, wow, wow, it's really cool. So we raised $25 million, not to make a reading machine for the blind, but to do the commercially valuable applications of character recognition, scanning contracts for lawyers and insurance forms for insurance companies and routing the mail, right? So, but in our hearts, the coolest application we could imagine of our technology was reading to blind people. And so Dave, who's my former boss, is the VP of engineering, I was the VP of marketing, and our teams built a reading machine for the blind prototype and we brought it to our board. So we're already selling lots of things to these commercial applications, but this is the cool new product. And everybody sitting around the board table has put at least a million dollars into our company. And I have a piece of paper, and it scans the page, takes a picture. And then our cool technology was turning that picture into the words that were on that page, and then we sent it to a first-generation Votrax voice synthesizer. You know, these are the times that try men's souls. <laughs> but not that natural sounding. <laughs> and the board was like, oh, cool, the demo worked. Jim, you're the VP of marketing. How big is the market for reading machines for the blind? I said, well, we've done a lot of study on that. We think it's about $1 million per year. <laughs> After a very uncomfortable silence, one of the investors says, and what's the connection to the $25 million we've invested in your firm. 
I said, oh, oh, it's easy. It'll be break even, million dollars a year, and it's the coolest thing that we could build. Our employees will be so happy. Our, our, you know, our customers will be proud of us, and we'll be helping millions of people read who couldn't read before. And they said, no. You promised to make us a lot of money. There's this giant market, that, and you aren't making us a lot of money yet, and we think that you should uphold your promise. And that's business as usual in Silicon Valley. You know, that's what, you know, and I admire it. I mean, we're really good at making money and starting companies, but we're not so good at doing social good. And, and we had promised our investors to make them a lot of money. But all is not lost. See, there's this cool thing about technology is you make one copy of something and you can make a million or 10 million or 100 million copies for not a lot more money, right? It's, it's that incredible power. It's what makes Bill Gates so darn rich, right? You know, makes one copy of Microsoft Office, sells a gazillion, okay? What if we harness that same power for social good? You know, we could, we could really change the world. We could do social change at scale. So I want to tell you the stories of a few people who have overcome that sort of naysayers that said, if it doesn't make a lot of money, put it back on the shelf. They said, no, no. I, in my heart, I wanted to become a technologist because I wanted to do cool things and solve problems. And just because it doesn't make a boatload of money, there's no good reason not to do it, which I think is a triple negative, but we'll work on that. So the first person I want to give you is my friend Victoria Hale, Dr. Victoria Hale. She's a pharmaceutical scientist. What was in her heart? She wanted to save lives making drugs. So, but she went to work for the FDA and Genentech, and she found that a lot of life-saving drugs don't make it out of the lab. And why is that? Well, imagine two drugs. The first drug fights a parasite that kills 100,000 people a year. The second drug makes middle-aged men feel like teenage boys again. <laughs> now, if you're a for-profit Western pharma company, which drug do you make? Oh, those 100,000 people? They're poor people in the developing world. <laughs> Who would do that? Gosh. No, you would rather make billions of dollars with a lifestyle drug. Lives or, you know, lives or lifestyle. I mean, geez, that's terrible. So Victoria said, no way. I'm going to start a nonprofit pharma company and I'm gonna make that drug that saves 100,000 lives a year. She, yeah, she's great. She, 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 oh, you know, there's this drug, it it's used to be used for another purpose, it, I think it'll kill this parasite. She ran the clinical trials, and this drug today is, is basically approved for sale in India and Nepal, fighting leishmaniasis, this terrible disease. So, the power of a single idea to save 100,000 lives a year. That's cool. So, the next place I'm gonna take you, Another kind of scientist. What can math geeks do for human rights? Well, it turns out that Guatemala is a country that's had a terrible civil conflict. Thousands of people were disappeared. A genocide was committed against the Mayan Indians. And the people who were behind the killings of thousands or tens of thousands or even 100,000 people, they got promoted. They were still in positions of power. That's called impunity. And I think it's unjust. So, a little bit more than six years ago, they discovered the secret police archive, the archive of the National Police, thought to be disappeared, 80 million pages. So, we sent some math geeks down there, and they modeled the warehouses full in three dimensions and did a volumetric sampling. It's very, very cool. And they pulled out 1,200 documents, and more than 10% were pertaining to a disappearance or a human rights violation. So there was gold in those 80 million pages. The stories of many people who had been disappeared and of the people who disappeared them. So, got down there, helped them scan a whole bunch of the documents. Now that more than 10 million of them are online. And then, two years ago, they said, well, what, what does it say? Let's, let's look up a really famous disappearance. Um, Garcia, you know, his, his widow is, is, is like head of the opposition in Guatemala. What can we find out about him? 400 documents pertaining to his disappearance. And based on that and other testimony, but our geeks went down there and testified, they were able to convict two active duty police officers of disappearing Garcia. And then last year, they appointed a new attorney general. She arrested the former head of the national police. Oh, then she went further. She arrested several retired military officers 
including the former dictator of Guatemala, Rios Montt, on genocide charges. Well, what did they do? They called our chief geek, Benetech's chief scientist, Patrick Ball. And he went down there and he did an analysis that showed that if you were a Mayan Indian in this area during the peak of that time period, that, that civil conflict, eight times the chance of dying as if you were Ladino, the white-derived ethnic group. We'll let the judges decide. But if we, as geeks, can do something to fight impunity, we will have helped honor the, the experience of those victims who for so long saw nothing happen to the people behind it. <sighs> so, but you don't have to be a geek or a PhD to make this kind of difference. I have two friends who are professional motorcycle racers. I think Manoj would like that, you know. And they wanted to help healthcare in Africa. So what do you do? Well, you stage a benefit race. And they raised 17,000 British pounds, and they went down to Africa to give the money to the healthcare workers. And what did they see? Dead motorcycles and dead vehicles. It just kind of bugged them, you know? They had to say, you know, what's wrong here? And people said, well, you know, it was missing a part, or it ran out of oil. And they said, ah. Oh. And then they had a great idea. What if we go to the health ministry and have them pay us a buck or two a month for every vehicle in their fleet, and we'll do preventative maintenance and keep them running? So that's what Barry and Andrea, my former professional motorcycle racer folks, did. And now, three times the people in the rural areas get access to health care because the Healthcare workers can get out there and deliver vaccines and drugs and bed nets. The power of a single simple idea, preventative maintenance. You didn't have to import a bunch of mechanics. The mechanics were there in all these African countries who really knew what they were doing. They needed a business model that would pay them to do preventative maintenance. They came up with it, and now millions of lives are being positively affected because they're getting access to the health care that they wouldn't get otherwise. Pretty cool stuff. So, and my story? Well, I left my, my uh, for-profit company. I started a deliberately nonprofit high-tech company, Benetech, so it organized as a charity, and we started making reading machines to the blind. Within three years, it was a $5 million a year, slightly profitable business inside a nonprofit. And we sold 40,000 reading machines basically giving people with disabilities the power to scan their own books rather than having people read to them. And then we went a step farther. And of course, this is because we're in Silicon Valley. We talked to our people and they said, oh, your software as a service, move to the cloud. I'm like, well, what does that mean? Well, we actually created Bookshare, sort of Amazon meets Napster, meets talking books to the blind, but legal. The first, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's got all this. And, and, you know, we changed the power structure of the traditional library for the blind. Instead of sighted people like me deciding what blind people could read because we couldn't afford it, if you thought it was worth scanning, we think it's worth having in our library. It's now the largest library for the blind in the world, and we have 198,000 users as of the beginning of this month. So again, it wasn't what we did. It was technology as a tool to let people, a community, actually write their own tickets so that they have the e-books that they need for education, employment, social inclusion, in books that can be turned into Braille, large print, or a voice synthesizer that sounds a lot better than the one that I demoed for you earlier. <laughs> so, what can you do to help? It turns out that you have tremendous opportunities, again, because technology brings the challenges of the world within our reach to actually do something about. You know, you can become a donor, and you don't have to have a lot of money. You know, something like, uh, like Kiva allows you to, to loan someone $50 to get a business going. Or Vitana that allows you to loan some money for, for edu post-secondary education for someone in the developing world. And there are many other organizations like that. If you have a great idea that actually could help humanity, figure out a way to make it a sustainable social enterprise. Become a social entrepreneur. Don't give in to the naysayers. If you control intellectual property, if you have an invention, if you have content, what does it cost you if somebody else takes it to the other 90% of humanity and doesn't mess with your top 10% revenue-generating business? It's easy to do. And when we ask high-tech companies to cooperate with this on this kind of basis, they say yes 80 or 90% of the time. Because in the hearts, I think, of most technologists is this desire to do important things. People are demanding it of their companies, and they want to make a difference. And then, of course, there's so many volunteers and things. Whether you go and you volunteer for TEDx San Jose CA, 
Or if you say, go to Random Hacks of Kindness, best brand name I've heard in quite a while, um, which is you know, weekend hackathons for social good, or go to work for Code for America, spend a year helping them develop technology for a community that's trying to use technology better to respond to their citizenry. Or we have a new project coming up called Social Coding for Good, sort of an online dating service for geeks that want to do social good. So you know, tell us your passion, your skill, your time availability, and we'll match you up with Wikipedia, or Mozilla, or some of our projects, or many of the other great open source projects that help society. The power of technology to do good, of a good idea to help millions. So, I believe that technology enables positive social change at scale. I believe that we can and we must give voice to oppressed people all over the world because every story of human rights abuse and suffering is a tool for justice. I believe that we can and that we must bring access to all of humankind's knowledge to every single person on this planet because education underpins all social good. I believe that we all want to bring about this better world because paying it forward manyfold is in our hearts and within our reach. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.